Soccer Talk podcast, the only podcast that focuses on watching soccer on TV, online and apps. In episode 94, we discuss UEFA Nations League and whether we love it or hate it, our memories of Peter Brackley, who sadly died this week, how the UK's Saturday blackout ruling has hurt 11 sports, and we have a bunch of letters from you listeners in our mailbag section. My name is Christopher Harris, a.k.a. The Gaffer, and I'm joined by my co-host, Kartik Krishnair. Now, Kartik, from this past week, uh, even though it was an international break, we got a ton of feedback from the listeners uh, on all sorts of um, points we raised last week, as well as some questions. But uh, we'll get to that a little bit later in the podcast. For those listeners who have never had a chance to hear the show before and and giving it uh, a chance for the first time, what we do is we dive deep into the everything from the, the soccer TV production to the online streaming options that are out there, um, the commentators, the, the highs and lows, but basically for kind of really hardcore soccer fans who want to enjoy watching the games, we give everything from tips to insight to analysis about watching the beautiful game and uh, we're here every week on every Thursday. Now, Kartik, from this past week, and this is a a request from uh, Trevor Hood, one of our listeners, he wanted to know uh, what was your and my favorite game of the week, and if we can continue doing that uh, each week when we're talking about what we've been watching. So I'll kick kick it off uh, with you, Kartik, and uh, what was your favorite match uh, that you watched uh, this past week? It was probably um, Netherlands-Germany on Saturday, which was a... A decisive Dutch win. I, I would say the reason it was my favorite game is I just really liked what I saw from um, the Dutch team who, who have been lacking the last few weeks, uh, last few years, and, and we've been waiting, all of us around world football, to see if and when they would bounce back. Uh, we, we're so used to the Dutch playing a certain style of football and also uh, being near the top of the world game, and um, they're not back yet. But this match was certainly a a statement of intent, and I really enjoyed watching the play of two players in particular. uh, Georgia Wijnaldum, who's had a fantastic start to a season at at Liverpool uh, and obviously had a very good season last season for Liverpool. And uh, so Georgina Wijnaldum is one player, and then Memphis Depay, who uh, has been playing at an exceptional level um, in Liga 1. But now that has translated to uh, essentially having to be the creator. He's playing, uh, we're in an era, Chris, where guys who are wingers are playing as kind of hybrid wingers uh, and uh, number 10s and and number 9s. So he's basically a 7, 10, and 9 rolled into one. And that shows with the Dutch team where um, he's got a lot of space to operate, particularly when Germany has the ball and gives the ball away. And uh, it was just a fun game to watch. One of the challenges I've had so far with the UEFA Nations League is that uh, there's oftentimes, I mean, a lot of the games are kicking off at the same time. I mean, not always, but most most of them are. So for the Germany games, I've been wanting to watch Germany play uh, this past week, but there's always been another game on that I'm watching instead. So in, re- in regards to Germany's performances, Kartik, and uh, their run of form, which has been really poor of late, is it... Is it that I mean this this German team is uh, falling apart, or is it just that the opposition they're coming up up against is uh, that much better? Well, I mean it's a combination of both. Obviously, I thought they played decently against France on uh, Tuesday. It was now uh, now that I think back, they are missing Mesut Ozil. I know a lot of people don't want to hear that, but they don't have that player in midfield who has a certain degree of guile and an ability to control the tempo of the match and play a probing ball in. To a number nine, and obviously they have problems um, at the striker position, and they are not getting the kind of production. For a long time, Germany survived with production from uh, uh, guys who were not out-and-out strikers scoring goals: Podolski, Thomas Müller, and others. They're not getting that anymore. And I and I have to say, I think there's a combination of players: uh, Draxler, Müller, Boateng, Hummels, who were way off their previous form. Um, and we saw that with all four guys in the World Cup. We saw, we've saw we seen that now in the Nations League. Uh, Yogi Lowe uh, has a lot of talent at his disposal. I think uh, he saved his job with the performance in Paris, it appears like. If they had gone out, they'd been beaten soundly the way they ha- were uh, in, in Amsterdam. He would have been out of the job. Now I think for November, he's just got to refresh the squad 
there is going to be increasing calls for uh, more young players. Germany has no um, shortage of talent. This is not a situation like the Dutch and especially the Italians. The Italians, you, if you looked at the Italian player pool a year ago, you could see why they missed the World Cup. They just had um, incredible deficiencies in a number of positions on the pitch. Uh, and incredible. And if you looked at Serie A, the vast majority of good players in Serie A are foreigners. Um, that's not the case in, in the Bundesliga and with Germany. So um, it, it, it's it's perplexing, and I know it's the talking point that everybody is discussing coming out of this Nations League, this international break, but um, I think they've got the talent at their disposal to turn this thing around. That, it may be too late in this group. Uh, the Dutch just need one more point to stay up, and uh, the French are probably going to win the group. But um, Germany needs to look towards Euro 2020 and not being embarrassed the way they were at this last World Cup. So my favorite game of this past week, Kartik, had to be Spain against England. Uh, this was a this reminded me of one of the better matches from like the early rounds of the 1982 World Cup, which I know for a lot of listeners is going way way back. But the the level of football in this one w- was fantastic. It was a um, you had everything. You had you had full blooded tackles. You had two teams that were definitely p- p- playing at a high level. Uh, you could tell that this was not a meaningless friendly. This was, uh, you mean, this this was meaningful. This was a great game. Uh, England, the first half, were absolutely incredible. Um, I mean, Harry Kane, of course, at the centre of that, but also Ross Barkley. Ross Barkley has really been this season a revelation, really. I think for Chelsea, I mean, he looks fitter. He looks more uh, even for Chelsea too. Senior manager and system. That's, yeah, that's yeah. He he looks like he looks like a new man. He looks like a new player, and he, and he really played his part in this game. Um, and then the second half, Spain bounced back. I mean, it was uh, Spain had most of the possession, of course, in this game, but they really pushed England. And uh, it was a Paco Alcazar, uh, the Borussia Dortmund uh, player, uh, got pulled a goal back from a beautiful header. He's been scoring goals like crazy. Uh, that was a joy to watch. But a really, really good game, and uh, I mean, thoroughly entertaining. And I posted something on Twitter too. I think. I said, um, what a difference this game made. Because uh, if you asked me on uh, well, uh, probably Monday morning what I thought about UEFA Nations League, I would probably have said, for the most part, been disappointing. But this one game has turned me um, and making me look more positive at the UEFA Nations League as a whole in terms of just the just the level of, of, of football that's being played. This was, this was absolutely fantastic. Now, on the Friday game, though, Kartik, uh, hopefully you didn't see this, but the Croatia England game was one of the dullest games I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, it was played in front of an empty stadium because of a, a ban on the Croatian supporters, uh, which unfortunately meant that the away supporters can, couldn't be there too. And it felt like it was watching a scrimmage game. It was really, I mean, just uh, horrible to watch. I mean, no atmosphere. And it, I think it, it uh, affected the players too because uh, it was just, a, it was just a, a debacle. It was just absolutely horrible to watch. Now, Kartik, I want to get your thoughts though too. I mean, on the UEFA Nations League so far, um, whether you love it or hate it, what, what do you think uh, thus far? I'm neutral about it. I mean, I don't hate it. I actually like the concept and, and, and um, really believe in the idea. And I think long term in football, we need maybe more of this and less cup, comp, cup, direct cup competitions and less friendlies. However, the thing I don't like is coming off a of World Cup. I think that the human body can only take so much. And there are a lot of players that just look tired that played in the World Cup over the summer that then uh, turn around. European club season starts. Uh, then they have these international breaks and you're throwing competitive matches into these international breaks. Now, in fairness, uh, going into after the 2014 World Cup and the 2010 World Cup, the initial batch of European qualifiers, qualifiers for the next Euros, were similar with kind of tired players, guys who were um, not performing uh, at a peak level. So I, I just think the calendar is too congested. I, I actually like the concept. I like the idea a lot um, and have been keeping up with it. It's just that – I. With the absence of a winter break in a lot of these leagues, a true winter break, I know people will say, oh, well, Serie A has a winter break. No, they really don't. Okay, they take a, a weekend off. That's it. Um, so, uh, and Spain's winter break has gotten shorter and shorter as well. So it's only really Germany of the, of the big leagues. Same thing with France. It's, it's a short, short break. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I just think that players are breaking down, and we see um, in the matches between the better nations, okay, uh, 
Spain, England being an exception. We see a lot of tired legs. We see a lot of slow movement. Now, the thing I do like, Chris, I have to point this out, is because I've been watching this program on Univision that they have, um, this Nations League program. So I'm, se- I'm seeing clips from every game. And then, obviously, ESPN FC shows a lot as well. Um, the matches between the likes of the Faroe Islands and yep. Liechtenstein and Gibraltar, they have been very entertaining. Mm-hmm from what I can see. So I think it's one of these things where if you don't have, if you don't qualify for a world cup and you don't have players that are really tired or are playing at the elite clubs in Europe, um, the performance level, the urgency, it's all there. Like any kind of competitive international and that I love because there's something potentially for those countries to win, which is promotion to the next, uh, next league. Uh, or in fact, in some cases, um, one of them is going to end up in the Euros uh, based on, this convoluted Euro qualifying that comes out of the Nations League. One or two of them might end up in the Euros. So Kosovo is another one I've enjoyed seeing. But um, for the big countries, it's been uh, it's been a little bit of a chore, honestly. Yeah, it's it's been hit, hit, hit or miss. I mean, some of the games have been good. Some of the games have been pretty drab and boring. Um, but what I do like about it, I mean, two things I like about it. One is the competitive uh, side of things where, like you said, too, the Gibraltars are playing uh, Liechtenstein. And normally in kind of World Cup qualifying in Europe, you've got a group that has England, I mean, I don't know, Germany, Portugal, and Gibraltar or something like that, or, or Liechtenstein. And those minnows have absolutely no chance. And it's it really is, um, you mean, a very one-sided game. So so with the UEFA Nations League, with those games being more competitive, the, the games, a lot of the games I watched this week were, were Wales playing, like Wales against Ireland, Wales against... Uh, Denmark uh, a few weeks ago, but, but a lot of games that were very on a similar level in terms of the countries and that I enjoy. The other part of uh, part of it I enjoy is the whole promotion relegation. I mean, these games, there's a lot yeah. on the line in terms of the teams moving up and da- down the ladders, and uh, now going into the next couple of games, it's going to get. Uh, I think it's going to going to get better and better as fans and also as the players. I'm sure uh, realize what's at stake and uh, how they could get moved up or moved down the league within the UEFA Nations League. Uh, it's it's. I like it. I like the concept of it, and uh, so far it's been good. Not all the games have been wonderful by any means, but uh, it's better than what the it's international break is is usually now speaking of the international break usually Kartik so the USA Columbia game was last week on the Thursday unfortunately I missed that one because uh, I was at my kids soccer practice but I came back switched it on and joined the post game so I was able to kind of watch a little bit of that Um, what I did notice which is really not surprising really is that you mean of course I come back switch on the TV see that the US had lost I think 4-2 I think it was and uh, went on to Twitter for a second, which is probably a mistake. And so just, <laughs> so just all, all the abuse and just all the negativity about, about the performance. And then listened to Rob Stone and uh, Marisa Du and uh, Alexi Lalas. And uh, it was all, uh, and also whoever the, uh, I think it was Jenny Taft or whoever the, um, the sideline reporter was. And everything was very positive. A lot of positive questions, a lot of like, hey, what do we, what, what do we take from this game? What did we learn? Uh, even the questions they asked, uh, I think uh, Dave Sarakin, uh, were very positive. No, no negativity at all until towards the end when Lala said, hey, I hate to be kind of the uh, curmudgeon, but um, I mean, we're not really learning anything from this. And it's 12 months since we've uh, since the disaster in, in Trinidad and T- Tobago, and we still don't have a coach. Um, and it, it was interesting because, I mean, Fox, we know we've talked about this for I mean, well, a couple of years at least. The rah, rah, rah. Um, and we saw this. And, and it was interesting for me. Rob Stone seemed angry. <laughs> he seemed, I don't know if it was. Well, he didn't like the crowd being not, uh, 80 or 90% Colombian, I guess. Yeah, and, and, and he's from Tampa. Right, he's um, from Tampa. But they, they put the game in Florida for a reason. I've been saying this for, for a month since. Uh, or six weeks since Tampa had been announced as the venue, that we knew why the game was being play, played here. Um, and I, I have to just a bone to pick with all the, the Twitter fandom that has gone after this state in the wake of this match. Uh, do you want known U.S. games to be played in this state against uh, 
countries from Central America or, or, or South America. Now, obviously, Orlando had a very partisan U.S. crowd against Panama a year ago. So maybe, uh, maybe there were exceptions. But it, it just seemed like there was a, a desire to pick on the state of Florida and pick on our diversity and, and the ethnic makeup of this state uh, because this game in Tampa had been so um, pro-Columbian, the crowd. It's... Uh, it, 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 it's, it's, got, it, it's gotten to the point, though, Kartik, where there's so few U.S. men's national team supporters come into these games that... Because okay, so of the ticket prices. R- right. But, but then Colombia has to pay the same ticket prices as the U.S. national team. True. So, uh, but, 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 I mean, so U.S. soccer, when they're picking these games and figuring out where to play them, it seems to be f- focused on the away team, whatever the away team... I mean, to bring Correct. in the most number yeah. of tickets and most n- number of revenue whether it's uh, you mean New Jersey for Brazil or for of its uh, even Colombia for Florida and, and uh, Peru for Hartford. I mean, it just it seems to be very... That's another one. I, it seemed like there were more oh, Peruvian sure. Oh, by, by, by far. I mean, with the Peru-USA game, uh, that game I did watch, and I watched that one. Um, I, had, I had my kids' soccer practice aligned with this one, so I was able to watch this game. And uh, this game was on ESPN. Um, Ian Dark and Taylor Twelman enjoyed the, enjoyed the, the commentary in this one. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that came out of this one. It was, wasn't really much to say about the game other than... Uh, I, I, the one thing I did think was annoying from this game, the USA-Peru game, was just the ticker on the bottom. I'm like... Yeah. It was like, ah, oh, it was just, just so distracting. Um, I mean, this has been a problem with ESPN for many, many years. But uh, any, any thoughts from the USA games, Kartik, or the coverage of the games that uh, you wanted to point out? Yeah, yeah. I, and we'll get to the U.S. women in, in, in a minute because I think that that, that d- deserves uh, merits a, uh, a separate discussion. But uh, from the men's game... Columbia game, uh, look, the U.S. was just undone by a better team, and the reactions on, on Twitter and the reactions from Fox were, were kind of visceral. Uh, I, I, I feel like um, there is um, it, it just a kind of desperation among the supporters and among U.S. fans. Lawless reflected that. You, you mentioned Lawless's comments. I think uh, Lawless has now moved into... I, I know a lot of people who listen to the show see him as like the chief cheerleader. I see Rob Stone in that role mm-hmm. and Fox executives in that role. I think Lawless is now in this this frustrated position that um, is more openly expressed by ESPN pundits. But um, that, OK, now we're we're past the World Cup. We're uh, past uh, nations who were in the World Cup hiring new coaches and playing an additional set of friendlies with those new coaches. Why are we still where we are at? Um, and so Lawless was reflecting, I think, the pulse of the of the fan base that night, whereas the rest of the Fox executives were reflecting the propaganda arm of uh, U.S. soccer. We're acting as the propaganda arm of U.S. soccer. Um, so c- let's continue to the Peru game. I, I think obviously ESPN get a very different approach. I was disappointed in. Um, the fact that this match was in Hartford and I thought ESPN would pull out all the bells and whistles because it's a, it's a home game for them, essentially. Um, and they didn't. And it was because they were confined by scheduling. Again, there's uh, baseball playoffs going on. So they're trying to cover that in uh, wraparound coverage. We'll talk more about the baseball playoffs when we get to the U.S. women. And then um, they, they, they had college football programming. They were trying to shove into um, a primetime slot on Tuesday, which l- limited them to, you know, a shorter game window. So we didn't get the kind of fantastic studio banter and discussion we got previously from Bredos and Gomez uh, and, and Casey Keller, among others. Uh, some good stuff on ESPN FC this week because Brian McBride's been uh, in Bristol and Ali Moreno's been there. and he, He's always very well-versed in, in U.S. developments and can talk about it. And Seb Salazar has been hosting, and he was fantastic talking about the U.S. coaching uh, situation when uh, Gab Marcotti asked him. You know, normally it's Seb asking Marcotti the questions. Marcotti asks Seb Salazar, why isn't Jesse Marsh a candidate for this job? Jesse Marsh, those of you who, who follow me closely probably know that I've said if he wanted the job, he should be the only candidate for the job. Uh, but he's not even on the list, it appears, right. uh, despite being American, despite being a former national team player, despite being a longtime MLS player. And Salazar said very clearly, you know, Marsh is very opinionated. He has kind of a possession based type of football that Red Bull plays. And now he's, he's obviously an assistant with Leipzig. Um, and they don't want that. They don't want guys that are controversial. They want uh, company men, more or less. Um, but anyway, I, I think for me, there is 
Um, and Taylor Tolman had a great rant at halftime about the Soccer Hall of Fame, which is another, uh, I'm looking for the right word, cluster, for lack of a better <laughs> term, um, with U.S. soccer. I think what we're seeing now, Chris, is there is a reflection among pundits outside of Rob Stone and one or two others on Fox. There is a frustration with the direction of this program that um, everybody panicked a year ago, but tried to be supportive and said, OK, this is our moment of reckoning. Let's make the right decisions. Let's set this, uh, put the ship on the right course. A year later, I think you're seeing open frustration from people on here. You're seeing open frustration on Twitter from uh, accomplished writers who I think a lot of our listeners may associate as pro MLS or pro U.S. soccer writers, but now have kind of uh, flipped the narrative because yep. we're a year on with no tangible changes to the uh, on-field uh, product, to, to, to the way decisions are made, to the transparency of the federation with these decisions. And you're just seeing every U.S. broadcast be uh, filled with a, with a degree of negativity that even I, as someone, a frequent critic of this program over the last decade, or more has has become uncomfortable with, um, but it's the reality of where we are at. So that was ESPN's broadcast, and that was Lawless on Fox's broadcast, and that's Twitter. And, and um, if the US, if U.S. soccer wants it to change, they're going to have to make some decisions. They're going to have to make some decisions openly mm -hmm. and um, credibly, and uh, engage the stakeholders in it. Otherwise, this is just going to continue. I mean, the friendlies in November against England and Italy could be even uglier on television and on Twitter if the right changes aren't made in the next three weeks. Well, that, well, that's the thing, though, too, because like, what we've heard is what the uh, U.S. soccer is going to announce the new coach in, was it early, early December? Yeah, something like that. Something like that, which, uh, I mean, everyone kind of thinks it's Greg uh, Berhalter that will get it. Um, there was a report today from ESPN deporters that said that uh, Tab Ramos uh, is, uh, is supposed to be getting it. But, I mean, whichever one it is, I mean, it's it's, it's absolutely crazy that, that U.S. soccer is waiting this long to make the announcement. And like you said, too, the next game's coming up against uh, Italy and England uh, in Europe. Uh, these are games where... You mean it, 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 the, the decision really needs to be made before that, and it's. I'd be surprised if it is. It's probably going to be after that point. No, um, and, and the thing that I I don't understand is so Dave Sarakin has been the interim coach for a year now. He keeps be, being given the power to uh, try out new players. I think he's done a really good job of, of his selections, and he's he's dug deep, right? He's pulled guys out of. Uh, the second division in, in the Netherlands, uh, a couple guys from the championship, right? English-born players he, he's brought into the pool. Uh, he, he's really done a good job of expanding kind of where the U.S. looked for players, uh, which has been a, a service. And I think Sarakin needs to be thanked for that. Mm -hmm. But then um, if he's not going to be the permanent head coach and he's not going to be the permanent head coach, why do you continue to let him um, – call in these teams because who knows the new coach might come in and say, you know, I, I don't want all these guys from the championship and from uh, the Dutch league that you're calling in. I want to just get back to the guys that uh, were in qualifying last year, which, you know, I hope the coach doesn't do that, but let's just say the coach wants to do that. And some of these guys haven't been called in since the Trinidad game. And you've called, you've essentially replaced the team with a, a lot of guys that um, are younger and are playing, playing their trade uh, abroad. And, the, and guys in MLS who are very young, not not your established MLS veterans. So, um, yeah, unless Sarakin is involved in the direction of the program, or he's being directed to say, "Hey, the new coach, whoever it is," but again, we don't know who it is, uh, wants these sorts of players uh, looked at. Because even when Sven Joran Eriksson had taken the Mexico job and wasn't on the job, and when Juan Carlos Osorio had taken the Mexican job and had left the, uh, the, the, the management to Tuca Ferretti uh, for a few matches before he formally took the job, I know from my sources who cover Mexican football that those coaches had input into the selection of uh, the, 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 the squads before they actually formally took the job because they had accepted the job. With the U.S., we don't know if that's the case because we don't know who the coach is and um, Sarakin has been an yeah, Sarakin's tenure as an interim coach is effectively longer than most uh, full time coaches end up managing at the international level. Let's just be honest. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. That's very true. Yeah. 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 I mean, he's molded the team his own way, which I think has been a useful service to kick the U.S. on. But if he's not going to be the coach, then maybe it's all for naught because the next coach might come in and say, oh, we really don't like this guy from Wigan. You're playing at left back. We're going to go back and find a guy in MLS or something like that. You never know. Right. All right, Kartik, before we move on, what about uh, the U.S. US women's team against uh, Canada? Uh, 
So um, I, I worked late. I got home from work and I turned on the game and oh, what I thought was the game, and there was a baseball game going on. I said, oh, this must be a mistake. I didn't go to my DVR <laughs> access. I said, right, I better watch the game from the beginning. And it turned out, um, obviously, uh, the U.S. had scored in the second minute. Uh, and uh, that, that goal held up until late, which was when the U.S. got the second goal. And I had taped the baseball uh, game. And Fox had moved the game to FS2 without anything scrolling during the baseball game to indicate that they had moved this game to FS2, except at the very beginning when I you know, turned my DVR on. And at 8.01, they were, or 8 or 8.01, they were, they were scrolling this. And then figure again, uh, baseball fans don't want to be bothered with, with soccer and that, uh, you know, it'll, it, it, there's a stigma about it. So let's not reinforce to those people like me that might, um, might be tuning in late that uh, the soccer game has been moved to FS2. Now, um, it was by it was just by usual reasoning. I said, ah, maybe it's on FS2, and it was. Um, but it, it, it was very frustrating because it showed me again, okay, I get that it's the baseball playoffs, and it gets better ratings. I don't know why the game was behind. I, I don't follow baseball. I have no idea. I had no idea there was a game going on at that time, at the same time as uh, – the U.S. women's game, which was, uh, again, very annoying. But it reinforced to me when they don't put something at the bottom of the screen indicating this, that, that we don't matter that much in the bigger picture to them, right? Soccer right. fans, now this, this U.S.-Canada uh, game was both teams had already qualified for the World Cup based on the results over the weekend and the games that uh, I think many of us watched. Uh, the U.S. Uh, crushing uh, Jamaica and uh, Canada with Panama or the reverse, actually. right? But um, but the um, the thing about this was it was still for the Concacaf title between two countries that have a rivalry, mm -hmm. and um, you know I, I think the the fir the only real test, the only game worth really watching for either the U.S. or Canada in this tournament that both had blitzkrieg through uh, was to watch this match, and um, I can't imagine the number of soccer fans who missed large portions of this match or risk the entire match because of this. Um, yeah, and if it was the other way around, if it was, I mean, a baseball game that had been moved to from FS1 to FS2, which probably w w would never happen, but because of soccer, you, you can be sure that there'd be you know, massive tickers on the bottom. Oh, you know, yeah. So. Well, I, it just was very frustrating, and I don't think Fox handled it well. Mm -hmm. As for the broadcast itself, I, I, want, to, I want to mention this. Um, uh, I thought the broadcast was really good. Uh, I thought I think Fox has done a pretty good with this job with this Concacaf tournament uh, all the way through. We, I don't say often positive things about Fox, but I think they have. I really liked whatever Ali Wagner was wearing yesterday. It was like it was a different, um, it was a different look. The sweater she was wearing or the the shirt she was wearing for what you normally see on a broadcast, and I think it really kind of popped. And I felt like I I want to see more of that. I think dress on broadcasts and on sets for soccer matches have become too conservative. Honestly, so so was it um, was it better I, than uh, Carlos Bocanegra's uh, sweater? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was a um, it was just like a multicolor sweater, and I thought it was it was just really popped uh, in, in halftime. And JP Della Camera, you know, these sorts of matches remind me of why we like Della Camera. I know he gets criticized a lot for his style by by purists or, or some soccer fans that are accustomed to more English style commentary. But um, when it comes to actually giving some sort of historical perspective in an important U S women's game, uh, there's no one better. I don't know if John strong can deliver the same sort of, uh, um, uh, same sort of uh, commentary in, in this sort of match. So I, I, I thought Del Cameron and Wagner, especially last night were really good. Um, and again, I, um, didn't see the first 20 minutes because, uh, and I missed Rose Lavelle's goal in real time because my DVR taped a, a baseball game instead. One more thing, Kartik, and that is something I've, I, I haven't done in years. I actually watched a NFL, NFL game. Well, at least part of it. <laughs> oh, that's more than I've ever done in years. <laughs> well, cause I, I was playing cards with my friends and we had, they wanted to watch the NFL game, which was the Chargers Patriots game on Sunday so I had it on in the background, so I wasn't really watching it, but I would look up every you know, every so many so many minutes. And what I saw though, Kartik, was uh, promos for Chelsea Man United, uh, which was I mean that that game had more than twenty one million viewers, 
Uh, and, I, and I thought to myself, well, I mean, congratulations to NBC for doing that. That's definitely the, the, the type of cross-promotion which we talked about recently on a podcast and in your, in your article, that's the promotion that uh, you don't see from other broadcasters. And so, so hats off to NBC for, for uh, promoting the, the Chelsea Man United game during the Chiefs uh, Patriots match. All right, Kartik, before we move on to the news and TV streaming segment, I do want to mention our sponsor, and that is SeatGeek. Getting tickets can be far too complicated with hundreds of sites and varying levels of reliability. It's hard to know who to trust. That's why SeatGeek is the way to go. SeatGeek pulls millions of tickets into one place so you can easily find the seats you want for a price you're willing to pay. There's nothing quite like being there in person, and SeatGeek will get you closer to the action for a great value. SeatGeek is designed to make your ticket buying experience easier than ever by searching multiple ticket sites and grading every ticket based on value. SeatGeek helps you immediately identify the best seats that fit your budget. Plus, every purchase is fully guaranteed, so you can shop for tickets on SeatGeek with confidence. Make SeatGeek your go-to ticket source for everything from sports and concerts to comedy and theater. I actually have the SeatGeek app on my phone, and it's by far the easiest way I've found to shop for tickets during the last few months. Uh, I've used it uh, this past summer to search for tickets to the International Champions Cup games for my family, uh, for the games that were in Miami, as well as a music concert featuring my favorite rock band, The Cult. Best of all, my listeners get $20 off their first SeatGeek purchase. Just download the SeatGeek app and enter promo code WSTPOD today. That's promo code WSTPOD for $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. Now, Kartik, let's move on to TV streaming news and some interesting news to kick off. Yeah, so I know a lot of people followed uh, 11 Sports showing matches at 3 p.m. Uh, in the U.K. from uh, continental European leagues. Um, they have uh, uh, ascended, ascended to, to, to uh, honor the blackout ban uh, that has uh, traditionally uh, occurred at this uh, time, but has urged soccer authorities not to leave the market to, quote, criminals, which are illegal streaming services, because uh, 11 Sports is contending probably correctly that people are going to try and find a way to watch these matches anyway in the U.K., um, now, the reason that blackout uh, is in, in place, and Chris, I think this is important for our listeners who may not realize this, who are used to getting a wealth of uh, te- what is 10 a.m. Eastern time games in the U.S., whether it be from uh, uh, the Premier League or the Championship. No matches are aired in that time slot in the U.K., which for me has been very inconvenient. When I've gone to the U.K. and I'm not going to a match, but um, can't watch the, the, the normal array of matches I see in, in the U.S. or India or other countries, Canada, uh, at that time. But it's in place in order to protect um, clubs from losing fans because, remember, the game is a very localized game in the United Kingdom. There are uh, professional clubs or um, clubs that are aspiring professional clubs in every town, in every neighborhood of major cities, um, every borough of major cities, uh, so or almost every borough. Basically, this ban has been in place to try and protect attendances and people who go to matches and protect those smaller clubs. Uh, but 11 Sports is warning, uh, perhaps correctly, that people are going to continue are going to now break the law to find streams of matches from the continent that kick off at that time. Yeah, this one this one's really interesting because 11 Sports had acquired the rights to La Liga, uh, among other properties in the UK. And they said they agreed. They said they announced that they were going to show games, some of the games on Facebook. So they were going to show for free to anyone on Facebook in the UK only uh, a La Liga game. Now, the challenge that they had was that um, with the kickoff times, they wanted to show some of the La Liga games that we were going to be shown during this uh, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. window in the UK, British time. Um, and they were planning on doing it. And, and actually, I think as of about a week ago, they, were, they, they said they, were, they, they basically uh, wanted to disregard, they couldn't care less about this regulation in the UK that says you couldn't show any uh, football during those uh, times. And they were going, going through with it. And then just within the last 24 hours, they decided to go ahead and, and not do that after all. Um, I, I understand why it's in place, the actual regulation, which actually came from the Burnley uh, chairman uh, back in, I think, the 70s or maybe 60s. He was the one that decided or kind of pushed for kind of to have the blackout. What he didn't uh, envision is where we are today, Kartik, where uh, on, on a localized level, it makes sense in terms of 
trying to prevent people to watch um, watch their TV, watch games at home on TV, and trying to encourage them to go to their non-league teams or football league teams or whatever it may be to go watch uh, games in person. What they didn't envision is that uh, you mean for all the countries outside of the out of the UK, so games for La Liga, games for the Bundesliga, Serie A, etc. And if you're a soccer fan and you're wanting to watch those games uh, in the UK during those time zones, you can't. Which so the the law the regulation that was put in place back in the 60s or 70s made sense at that time. Uh, but it's completely out of date in, in these days. And like Eleven Sports says, what it does, it gives more power to the illegal streamers. So the legal streamers are benefiting from this. The the people that are in the UK who do want to watch La Liga or do want to watch Premier League um, will oftentimes find illegal streams. And a lot of those illegal streams of the Premier League are NBC uh, coverage because yeah. uh, all the games are covered. And or, or La Liga or whatever league they want to they watch. And I realize, Chris, when I go to the UK and people are talking to me about the NBC covers, the reason they <laughs> know it so well is because they've been watching illegal streams. I'm not joking. Right, I mean, right, not- right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, which, um, yeah, so something has to be done. I don't think anything's going to be done, though. That's the thing, though, because it's so, I don't know, I, I just don't see them changing it uh, anytime soon. I'm sure that... Uh, yeah, no, no, and, and, and probably eleven force uh, eleven sports uh, back in off on this will. Um, I mean, I, in some ways, I wish they had pushed for it to see what would ha- what would have happened, but uh, it was not meant to be. Next up, Kartik is some sad news, and that is um, unfortunately the death this week of uh, commentator Peter Brackley. Now, Peter Brackley, for some of those listeners, may not be a very familiar name. He is. Uh, though a very familiar voice. So let me go ahead and play a little clip of his um, commentating a Serie A game and uh, listen to his voice and see if you remember Peter Brackley. Aradio, now Savicevic. Panucci had made the overlap, but look who's back there defending Ravinelli. Really has been a feature of Juve's play this season, the commitment that they've shown. As underlined here again by Ravinelli. Now Baggio, just feeling his way back really into the senior side after his lengthy layoff. Ravinelli, Octo Viali here, looking to extend Baresi. Good shot, and Rossi down with a save. Yeah, and there you go, that's Peter Brackley. So I think a lot of listeners will remember the voice, and, and uh, for, for a lot of the soccer fans in the United States, Peter Brackley did a lot of the FA Cup commentaries. Uh, oftentimes, uh, kind of the earlier rounds, especially the third round, when it'd be uh, just one commentator. Uh, in the UK, he's better known for um, Serie A. He used to do a lot of yeah. the Italian soccer there. Um, but but it's someone he, I haven't I, I did not have the chance to interview or speak with. Uh, I thought of highly, and I, I knew that he was a you mean a commentator that's been in the game for a long, long time with a, a long history, and. Um, also seemed like a, a person that was well respected within the football commu- a football co- commentator community, and uh, de- definitely sad to, to see him pass away this this week, Kartik. Yeah, I, I hadn't heard his commentary in quite some time, but I associated him always with uh, with uh, those early round FA Cup matches, um, really in the two thousands. Yeah. And I want to say he was he was the sole voice on. Um, on, on many of those matches, I remember him calling a, a match, uh, uh, a, a couple of Man City matches in the mid-2000s uh, when the FA Cup was more important than it is now for the club because we were very ter- terribly competitive um, in, in other competitions. So uh, I, his voice always carried me through those matches. And then obviously he's best known for um, – uh, football Italia and and the things he did uh, to promote Serie A in the UK. In fact, I, I I've talked to some people since his passing, and they and they attribute now maybe this is the sort of uh, tribute you get after someone passes, but they attribute the popularity of Serie A in the UK largely to his voice and his promotion of the league. Uh, him and and James it's Richardson to a lesser extent. Yeah, uh, but he was that closely associated for those in the UK with uh, Italian football. Um, and and uh, a lot of uh, people who watched Serie A in its heyday when it was absolutely the best league in the world in, in the late 90s uh, 
associated his voice exclusively yeah. with that league. So well, well, you, uh, you can say the, big deal. I mean, you could say the same thing too about uh, the Bundesliga and Toby Charles. I mean, Toby Charles yeah, is, is still right. alive and, and kicking, but but I mean, it's it's synonymous with the Bundesliga. I mean, there's so many soccer fans in the United States that remember Toby Charles and have a love of the Bundesliga because of that one person. And just goes to show with Peter Brackley doing the commentating for Serie A. And, of course, James Richardson, I mean, in, in outside the studio or sipping coffee in, in, in Italy. Um, that was kind of, I mean, he, he had a big impact, too, on Serie A, the popularity of that league in the UK and, and around the world, really. Karthik, let's move on to um, the next uh, news item. Yeah, so Football TV has hit almost... Uh a quarter million subscribers, 250,000 subscribers, which is more than double the number of subscribers they had 12 months ago. And uh, Fubo's promotions are everywhere. Uh, it, it's funny, Chris. Uh, this is a little commentary on this. Uh, 12 months ago, because I've had Fubo since essentially the beginning of uh, four years now, um, I, I would say I have this service, and no one would know what I was talking about. They would think I was talking about Sling. Now, everybody I talk to knows about Fubo, so they're doing something right, and that shows with these numbers. The other thing, too, is this weekend um, they're going to be uh, streaming Chelsea against Man United and Huddersfield against Liverpool in 4K, 4K Ultra yeah. HD uh, through Fubo TV. So, so if you do have a... Um, uh, a device that they can uh, actually show 4K. Uh, go to the worldsoccertalk.com website, and on the homepage, there's an article that goes into more detail about uh, how you can get that to work with a free trial to Fubo. Uh, just a quick note on that, by the way, for those of you who have Direct TV, I uh, was not aware of it at the time, but uh, uh, subsequently found out from my uh, parents that Liverpool versus uh, Man City was in 4K special presentation on a separate Direct TV channel. If you have 4K, yep. uh, I, I wasn't aware of it at the time, but um, look for that in the future also if you have direct TV. And the last news item is uh, in an interview last week with Atlanta Journal-Constitution uh, newspaper, Tim Howard was interviewed about uh, the TNT UEFA Champions League coverage. And uh, definitely check it out. The article is pretty interesting. But uh, Tim Howard was quoted as saying, I think soccer coverage in America gets a bit boring sometimes. Same old song and dance and same old people. What we are doing at Bleacher Report is showing another side to the players. There's a cultural side of football that people are hungry for. You see that in, in our coverage. We are going, uh, we're, we're giving them stories that they may uh, otherwise see or may, may otherwise not see. It's Neymar's tattoos and it's the fashion and all the things that surround the game. So, so there you go. You got t Tim Howard uh, kind of mentioning kind of the one of the reasons why Turner's coverage is different is they're trying to tap into more of the football culture. And uh, in the future, uh, we hope to have an interview with the, the producer of TNT's uh, soccer coverage so we can find out more details about understanding the why and understanding why they're covering the soccer and, and UEFA Champions League uh, in, in a different way than, than Fox has done, than ESPN has done, than NBC has done. Uh, so that'll be interesting uh, to see and, and to hear. So that, that'll be coming up in the next, um, ne next, next couple of weeks on the podcast. Moving on to TV ratings, Kartik. Uh, I don't have a lot of them right now, but we, we'll, we'll have more at uh, worldsoccertalk.com. Uh, some of the numbers that came out, uh, 299,000 viewers for the U.S. women's national team against Jamaica uh, in that uh, qualification match on Sunday on FS1. Uh, just prior to that, on Thursday, I think it was, was the um, USA against Colombia uh, men's on uh, FS1 also, 280,000 viewers for that. So the women women uh, beating out the men on the, the viewership there. And then uh, Poland against Italy uh, on Sunday uh, on ESPN, that one had uh, 170,000 viewers. Kartik, as far as the metrics go, I mean, we look at attendances, we look at uh, TV numbers, uh, we look at, you mean, kind of just just a lack of interest overall. It seems in this U.S. men's national team, um, which goes back to what we were saying just earlier in the podcast, is that they need to get moving quickly in, in terms of having a new coach on board because they're they're at the risk of losing more and more um, fans of of uh, U.S. soccer of the actual men's national team. It seems. Yeah, and I, I think they're also to a certain extent uh, a victim of. MLS expanding because I think, um, and, and I've 
said it's a healthy football culture. I've publicly said this when you have uh, people who, who, who feel their club team is more important or as important as the national team. And that was not generally the case in this country. But as MLS has expanded and USL has expanded, uh, I think there are more and more people attached to their club team, which means the U.S. has has a higher standard that they need to achieve on the international level. And why is a higher standard? I don't mean something that's impossible. I mean, just the basic standard they achieved during the 2000s, right? The period from 99, from that 99 Confederations Cup through uh, the 2010 World Cup, I think is the apex uh, of U.S. soccer. Yeah, there was the 2006 uh, World Cup failure in there, but generally pretty good results, generally competitive, very well respected in Europe when I would go to Europe at the time. Now the U.S. is viewed more as a joke uh, in terms of national team play. But if they don't achieve that standard, Chris, these ratings are going to continue to plummet. This is an alarming number. This 280,000 from Fox. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Univision number uh, is very good, but um, I think that's a lot of Colombian fans, Colombian American fans watching. For sure. Uh, And then there was also a lead into Mexico, Costa Rica, which was on uh, immediately after. In fact, the Mexico, Costa Rica match kicked off before USA Colombia ended. So I think that's a lot of Mexico fans also uh, continuing on to watch Mexico, Costa Rica. Uh, uh, That 280,000 number is is incredibly alarming. And I think that has uh, more to do with the general feeling about this player pool and um, the lack of a coach, the lack of direction. Um, and quite frankly, a U.S. soccer federation that I've said it for many years, you've said it for many years, but now I think more and more fans realize it is much more concerned with uh, finances and the economic bottom line than any sporting consideration. The sporting considerations only matter if it makes them money. Um, right. So I think that the fan base is very jaded and, and ratings are going to continue to plummet, which potentially – when we get to the renegotiation window, which begins in 2021, I understand, for the next TV contract. So we're only three years away. It's before um, the, the World Cup, Cup in 2022. Right. Yes. Could affect that price. And we know that they're bottom line driven. So maybe that's the incentive to improve the product. Yeah. But but then you look at the 2026 World Cup and you go, you mean, U.S. Uh, being in that competition and then all the games, all the qualification. Well, actually, no, I guess in terms of that, they will be automatically qualified to play in the. Well, we don't know that yet. That's they true. Probably will be. That's true. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We don't know the format. But, um, of- but going, going back to what you said, Kartik, in previous years, I think we've talked about um, the most popular club team in the United States, club soccer team in the United States, was the U.S. men's national team. Correct, yeah. Although, they, you know, of course, they're not a club team, but the, the way that fans I mean, followed and, and really uh, immersed themselves in the national team was very much like a club team, very much like almost like a, a Manchester United supporter that, that, you mean, you're just really passionate. And that's something I think in the past what, two years, three years, is U.S. men's national team soccer fans have lost belief in the team. You go back for the last decades, and I mean, U.S. soccer fans were passionate and believed in in the men's national team. Your point is so well taken. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I have to mention this. During the hexagonal in 2009, qualification for the 2010 World Cup, I talked, and we were doing a separate show through World Soccer Talk at the time called Major League Soccer Talk, which focused, it focused on MLS, but then We were hearing from fans constantly during league play between the international breaks. Hey, you know, the U.S. national team is my is my club team. What what about the next break? I'm having withdrawal. We just had two qualifiers. We have two more qualifiers in the next break. How are the national team guys doing? And to the point where, if you remember on that show, Chris, we began focusing more on the U.S. team, even though it was branded an MLS show. And we ended up focusing more on the player pool because the majority of U.S. Top U.S. players at the time were playing in Europe, unlike now, Um, although I think that's starting to happen again now, to where we were focusing on European football and specifically how the Americans were playing because the audience was treating the U.S. men's national team as their club team. Uh, Absolutely the case a decade ago or when we were doing that show, which was a decade ago. That was, yeah, 2006, 2007, 2008. So um, yeah. s- some formative years for, for the growth of the game in, in, this, in this country. But, uh, yeah, good points, Kartik. Uh, let's move on to listener mailbag. We've got uh, first up is JP, uh, and this is in regards to the podcast talking about uh, Turner's coverage of the Champions League. It says, maybe Turner is finally learning. While watching the Celtics game on TNT this week, I noticed that they were doing some in-game promotions for the UEFA Champions League. Uh, the ALCS coverage on TBS also has a lot of promotions 
for Bleacher Report Live in general, but not specifically uh, UEFA Champions League. Alexander yeah. says, uh, this is in regards to the League MX uh, Major League Soccer possible merger. I like the idea of a North American soccer uh, Super League. I even more like the idea of a European Super League. Basically, end the UEFA Champions League, have a UEFA Super League that adds the top teams from each league, similar to the Champions League now, to the Euro Super League 1. The next lower clubs in the standings go to the Euro Super League 2, etc. The teams then play matches around the same time as they play UEFA Champions League games. However, there is no group stage, just regular league play between Europe's most coveted clubs. At the end of the season, the top four clubs play in a two-leg, uh, two two-leg semifinals and then a final. Uh, I feel that would produce a lot more intense matches between similarly skilled clubs. Kartik, any thoughts on that one? I mean, I don't like the UEFA Super League idea because I think it's a it's a pretense to trying to pull um, big clubs out of their domestic leagues and close the league off. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's that's my objection to it. I know there are a lot of people in the U.S. who like it. I mean, it it could be to the point where we would be less offended by closed leagues if they do this, and we we're conditioned to to open leagues now. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not I'm not a fan of the to idea. Me- yeah, to me, to me, the Champions League is the European Super League uh, in a, a different format, but uh, it's a similar... I mean, we already have it in, in many ways. I mean, if you want to watch... I mean, the Ch- UEFA Champions League, for a lot of people, is bigger than, say, the Bundesliga, bigger than Serie A, it's, in terms of the importance of, of that of that uh, tournament. Um, so it's, it's almost at that point anyway where that becomes the priority for a lot, a lot of soccer fans, but more emphasis on that on winning the UEFA Champions League than they would say necessarily kind of a, a title in that in 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 that country whatever whichever country you're looking at uh, Paul Scanling uh, says, I finally got to listen to the latest episode. I still don't understand how combining leagues helps Mexico. Their ratings are already the highest. I'm not sure it really helps Major League Soccer playing against much superior competition with resources they are unwilling or unable to match. Travel costs go up. Regional rivalries go down. What's the benefit? Major League Soccer thinks they will benefit in what way? Increased ratings and sponsorships? I doubt it will offset the increased costs of trying to compete with Liga Mekis teams. This is just another example of American soccer trying to reinvent the wheel. It ain't broke, but we are desperately trying to fix it. And, and for what? Power? Prestige? Just another stupid idea. What I would say with Liga Mex or Liga Mekis, depending on your pronunciation, is that um, I think what they have to gain is really more on the the sponsorship, on the on the revenue yeah. side of things, on the business side of things, which they look at Major League Soccer and go, okay, well, the leagues in terms of the quality level is not as good as Liga MX. Um, you know, judge, you look at that Concacaf Champions League as one example. But the way that they do business and the way that they're able to work with um, major uh, U.S. companies in terms of sponsorships and, and, and revenue, uh, that works. And it's very – it's like a machine. It works very well. And I think that's what Liga MX is looking at to say, okay, hey, let's work together on this. Maybe you can help us um, you know, generate more revenue for, for that, these Mexican brands. And with some – Working with the, the Mexican national team and working with the U.S. men's national team uh, to promote these games and, and all the other marketing side of the things, I th- in many ways, it's, it's a good fit to have the Liga MX work closely with some and Major League Soccer to increase revenues if, if that's what their priority is, which, which I'm, they're businessmen, so I'm sure it is. Yeah, it's all about sponsorship. Um, they, they cite the TV numbers, they talk about that, but it's all about Liga MX and Mexican clubs getting greater sponsorships and uh, having some sort of united might to, to counter uh, the, the popularity among corporate executives and potential advertisers of European football. Uh, but I I don't know that it'll work either. I, I share a lot of Paul's skepticism, although I, I know that the reason they're pushing this is exclusively about sponsorship. Addition by Relegation says, On the podcast, I'm one of those who don't really watch the pre- or post-match show during the week. I'm lucky if I'm able to catch the game at all, and I consume most of my analysis from podcasts like yours throughout the week. Keep up the good work. And last but not least, uh, Kelly Outlaw says, uh, NBA on TNT would get crushed by soccer. Uh, Let me say that again. NBA on Twitter would get crushed by 
would get crushed by soccer Twitter because the pregame show is fun, light-hearted, and doesn't take itself so seriously all the time. I'm a huge fan of soccer, but sometimes they need to get the, st <laughs> the stick out of their butt. Kartik, what, what, what do you think about that one? Yeah, I, I can kind of see it both ways because I think um, the the TNT uh, NBA studio has become is is very lighthearted, as Kelly says, and very um, very much into kind of like pushing cultural buttons and being edgy. Uh, they don't really analyze the games uh, the, in a straightforward uh, manner, uh, whereas we as soccer fans are accustomed to more kind of tactical analysis, more uh, in depth breakdown uh, of. Uh, of matches, uh, maybe it's because there's less and uh, less bumper soccer programming on American television. That when we get some, uh, we we feel like we need to make the most out of it. I think that's part of it. Um, my complaint about the the basketball studio with TNT has also been when they shift those guys to college basketball for the NCAA tournament, they don't seem to know very much about uh, what's going on in the college game, and I don't know if they're as poorly informed with the NBA. I'm guessing they're not, but um, that kind of was a harbinger for me as to how they would handle soccer is that, you know, a lot of times they don't know uh, about these clubs. Now, actually what we found with the TNT studio, uh, Chris, in uh, soccer is, in Champions League is that they do know about the clubs, but they really don't want to talk much about it. They want to talk about these other things that Tim Howard uh, referenced and um, both ways. I think there might be a market for that. And I think perhaps uh, the people on soccer Twitter are the same people watching ESPN FC every night and they're getting the analysis anyway from uh, a different network. So yep. maybe Turner is appealing to another audience. Yeah, I would say that for TNT, I don't envy uh, the challenge that they have in front of them. So part of it is determining who are they targeting when they, when they have these uh, pre-game and uh, pre-game and post-match uh, coverage, the analysis and, and discussion, etc. Uh, are they targeting the diehard soccer fans who are already consuming the product, or are they trying to reach out to a new audience that may not uh, have watched soccer that much and try to bring them in that way? At the end of the day, it all comes down to the numbers, and the numbers will show whether or not it's working uh, in terms of targeting these folks. Uh, and it's too, still too early to tell. But uh, again, again, hopefully we'll have an interview with uh, the TNT producer, uh, the producers of the soccer coverage, to get some insight into um, their thinking and, and uh, why they're going about things a certain way. Now, listeners, you can always reach us through email, through web at worldsoccertalk.com, as well as facebook.com slash worldsoccertalk, and on Twitter at worldsoccertalk. Uh, plus, of course, you can always post comments at uh, worldsoccertalk.com. We'd love to get your feedback. We'd love to get your opinions. We'd love to get uh, your questions or advice, whatever it may be. And we'd love to read those out on air. All right, Kartik, uh, coming up uh, this week, um, lots. I mean, we go back into the international break is over. Got some big games coming up, uh, thankfully, and it uh, should be interesting to watch. Uh, so, so for listeners, uh, if they want to find out uh, your latest um, analysis or thoughts or, or rants or raves, where can they find you on Twitter? Yeah, just check me out at KKFLA737 and you can jump wherever from there. All right, guys. Well, thank you for listening. You can get a new episode of the World Soccer Talk podcast every Thursday. Every episode is released on SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, TuneIn, Audioboom, and WorldSoccerTalk.com. If you like the show, share it with your friends on social media and give us a review on iTunes. And Kartik, heading into another busy weekend, what should they do? Enjoy your football. <laughs>